I just want to, before we, um, before I introduce our speaker for today, I just want to thank you again for coming. More so, I want to thank you for all the work you have been doing and that you will continue to do. I, I, um, I honor the, the dedication and the sense of um, just service that you bring to your families, to your kiddos. Um, and so thank you. And I would just ask for all of you to take a breath, a couple of deep cleansing breaths. And I want you to just think about the last 24 hours and see if you can call to mind, they, they, there's a saying that the body remembers, right? That the body keeps score even if we think we're not. And I want you to try to call to mind right now just one brief moment that brought joy to you. It may have been seeing a colleague that you haven't seen in a couple years because we've all been separated. It might have been hearing a bird or seeing the beautiful hawks uh, that fly overhead out here in, in Collegeville. Maybe it was just, uh, for me, I'm always just entranced by seeing the vines that grow up these old brick walls that were built by hand. Um, just try to capture how that made you feel and own it. And this coming year, when things get rough and you're just feeling like, oh, take a breath and try to bring yourself back to that moment and try to let your body remember what that felt like. Just to give yourself a couple seconds of respite. Um, and with that, I'm, I, I just am going to say goodbye and thank you again for coming. Um, and I would like to now go into introducing our speaker for this morning. Um, let me just bring up my notes. So as you know, I'm, I'm, I uh, work at the Center for Early Education and Development at the University of Minnesota. And um, I never had the personal good fortune of meeting one of SEED's former directors, Mary McAvoy. Some of you may have. You may have heard the name. Um, and Mary was just a dedicated and fierce champion. I had the a task of going through our archives and our historical documents, and I came to know her in a way that I wouldn't have ordinarily. Um, and I was just humbled and moved by what a fierce advocate she was for anyone who was marginalized. Um, and one of the things I came to understand or I discovered is that she had a saying that she would ask seed staff at the time as a way to make us think and wonder and to provoke and promote and encourage. And that question was, what would you do for families and children if you knew you could not fail? And I often think of that question um, now when, when I, in my role, am confronted with things that need problem solving. And our speaker today has answered that question over and over again. Um, Dr. Jerry Costa is, um, has had this very long and distinguished career. Um, over, the, over the course of the years, he has pushed the boundaries of how, in particular, um, educators think about and approach people with ASD. He's also done amazing things in bringing infant mental health principles into the world of special education, um, which to me has brought a kindness and a humanity that is sorely needed in understanding um, some of the behaviors and reactions that we may be seeing in some of our kiddos. Um, Dr. Kostya is newly retired, but uh, we have teased him to say that he's not being very successful at it because he continues to train and appear as a speaker. Um, but he was, the, um, he was a professor in the Department of Teaching and Learning at Montclair State University, and he was the director of the 
Center for Autism and Early Childhood Mental Health. He is still on faculty at Fielding University um, in the Infant and Early Childhood PhD program. He's been a consultant for Zero to Three, which is the Infant and Early Childhood Mental Health Organization, does terrific work. He's been a consultant there for the past 20 years, and um, he was among the first of their expert faculty uh, in the new DC Zero to Five classification system. He was appointed by two separate state administrations in New Jersey to head the Infant and Early Childhood Mental Health Committee within their early childhood, uh, or their, their council for young children, pardon me. Um, he holds a plenitude of degrees and certifications, boggles my mind. Um, he holds a PhD in developmental psychology from Temple University. He is a trained faculty member on the Brazelton Touchpoints method. He, is a self he has a self-regulation certificate from the Merit Center in Canada, and he holds a Category 4 endorsement as an infant mental health mentor from the Alliance for the Advancement of Infant Mental Health, um, which is an international organization. Um, he is a licensed psychologist as well in New Jersey. And uh, Jerry has worked on numerous initiatives throughout the country uh, for states and different organizations. He's offered hundreds of trainings and uh, speeches and um, just from around the country and actually around the world. And he's authored dozens of articles and book chapters um, in recognition for all of this prodigious and amazing body of work. He's been honored with numerous awards most recently, and this one I'm happy to say I was a part of the committee um, that selected him. Um, he was awarded the 2021 um, Weatherston Leadership in Infant Mental Health Award from the Alliance for the Advancement of Infant Mental Health, which is um, was a real honor. And I would say, given this, He's done a pretty good job of answering Mary McAvoy's question, wouldn't you say? Um, but you know, that is not what led me to invite Jerry to speak to us today. I think when I, earlier I shared that he's done this amazing job of um, bringing in infant mental health principles into the, the greater community of education. And if you know anything about infant mental health principles, you know that um, there is a, a focus on reflective practice and mindfulness and bringing in, uh, uh, giving ourselves time to think about how we are in our work. And that to me is a very critical piece in being an effective professional. Um, and so he is going to talk to us a little bit about that today, particularly when it comes to things like this, to professional development. Um, it's not just about learning that core foundational knowledge, which yes, is absolutely essential, but it's also looking at how we as human beings integrate that with our internal selves and what we do with it and how we then show that to the people we are working with. There's a saying in the world of infant mental health that how you are is as important as what you do. And I think that today that's one of the things that uh, Jerry will help us understand a little bit better. So with that, Dr. Costa. That was so nice, thanks. So I don't think I have to give the presentation. I think Deb just did a great job of outlining it. I really do appreciate um, being invited here and uh, to have a chance to have a session, but also to uh, offer this um, presentation as a plenary session. And I think the thing I would want to say is Deb's leadership is remarkable. Chris Watson, who everyone I think knew or knows, um, was the prior recipient of the Weatherston Leadership Award. So it was. The first year it was named after Deb Weatherston, 
uh, this wonderful leader from Michigan, uh, then Chris and then me. So I, I just love following Chris around uh, and Deborah and I, I'd be happy to, you know, uh, hold his suitcase as he travels. Um, so thank you. Um, I really uh, look forward to, to this presentation and um, it's really something I've been thinking for some time. So why don't I get right into this idea, but you can see the title is uh, reconceptualizing training as professional formation in the field of infant mental health. And um, in the, I, I think the chapters and the materials might be available to everyone, but certainly those who took or are taking my session, which I ended early yesterday and no one told me. Uh, so, uh, uh, you know, I, I thought it ended 4 o'clock and, and it ended 4.45, it was supposed to, so, uh, but they have access, but this chapter um, is available, I think, right? It is, yeah. So, let me begin in this way. I think one of the things that all of us who are involved in teaching and, and in the helping professions, because we are a multidisciplinary, transdisciplinary field, um, I think all of us continue to discern what's the best way uh, to help prepare the workforce, this multidisciplinary workforce. And that means we have to think about the field of teaching, pedagogy, but also we have to think about how people learn best. And that's really based on epistemology, this notion of how we come to know what we know. So the two questions that really kind of led me to think about this work is how do we best teach about our discipline, infant mental health? And how do learners, we learners, come to know what we know? So I'm going to question, I think, common methods of professional development, which often rely on training uh, that focuses on the transmission of core knowledge. You know, we view that knowledge as really fundamental uh, to the discipline. Um, but also, we talk about developing skills as well, uh, which, which derive from that knowledge, that lead us to that knowledge. But I think that's not enough, right? And so such an approach fails to adequately recognize and apply what we have been learning for a long time about the science of interpersonal processes and the emotional, affective, and interpersonal context of our work. So I have to say I do a lot of work in the field of autism spectrum disorder, and this is particularly evident to me in the field of autism spectrum disorder, which, uh, which currently has a predominant dominant paradigm, uh, which is shifting, I, I'm happy to say, uh, which, oh bless you, which focuses which, with, with educational, that's a habit, I couldn't help saying, God bless you, I, I probably brought too much attention to you, I'm, I apologize, I apologize. <laughs> Uh, you know, those good Catholic kids, you know, the uh, to say that. So, uh, but in the field of autism, the predominant educational protocol and even clinical protocols rely on the notion that we have to provide uh, training and discrete um, uh, development of skills and techniques for managing and forming behaviors. But I'm going to introduce to you a concept I'm calling formation. And by the way, this is a wonderful context to talk about formation because um, although many people thought I picked the term formation because of Beyonce's uh, album, uh, I did not. I did not. Uh, formation, formation, formation is actually a term I borrowed from um, communities like this Benedictine uh, monastery. It's, it's about unfolding, it's forming uh, who we become. So I'm gonna talk about this notion of formation and I think it embodies for me some ideas, and I think Deb said it so nicely, how we sort of integrate what we know into who we are, and so it's talking about integration. There's a kind of personal unfolding. Something happens to us as we unfold, as we become who we become. And I think it involves, and I'll talk about this, even learning about the different layers of yourself that we have to uh, connect with. And so I'll talk about three interrelated ways of developing, and that's called ways of knowing, ways of doing, and ways of being with. And so in order for me to do that in this small um, t amount of time, uh, but the chapter explains it more if you're interested, um, I'll talk about some uh, science regarding relationships. And there are three particular uh, approaches I mention 
uh, and I'll mention today, but very briefly. One is a, a theory that was developed by a neuroscientist named Stephen Poiges, named polyvagal theory. What I like about the theory is that it really talks about how our brain is fundamentally wired for relationships and how we actually change each other's brain by the way in which we are with others. Uh, and it's a remarkable uh, way of, of thinking about that. And that's true as educators, it's true as clinicians, whatever your profession is, right? I'll talk about that whole notion of interpersonal neurobiology, how we actually then influence each other, help each other, regulate each other, and that regulation part, Stuart Shanker's work, I'm gonna talk about in my course, but I'll mention self-regulation. So this model of formation, I hope, serves as a guide for all of us who are trying to develop um, a responsive, multidisciplinary workforce, uh, this kind of uh, process here that we're having at this institute. So I am proposing, just for the moment I'll talk about autism, I'm proposing that in the field of autism, uh, that we are in the midst of a paradigm revolution. I think the notion that how we think about, understand, and intervene, and appreciate autism, and in its ways that it can be appreciated, although many, many people suffer, right? We know that that's the case. We know that there's a shift in how we are understanding what autism is. And I think this paradigm revolution um, is in the midst, and I'm, I'm happy for all of us to be part of that revolution. And so what I think is true is that at times of disruption, of paradigm shift, it really helps us to reframe what we are doing. And by the way, the research I did looking for formation, I was only able to find a series of studies at the Carnegie Foundation that looked at formation. And they're the ones that talked about the notion of reframing as one of the goals of leadership, one of the defining tasks of leadership. And so I'm gonna assert that we must reframe professional preparation as professional formation uh, as the field moves from more mechanistic and behavioral paradigms towards a developmental relational one. So I began um, with four naughty questions. By the way, I call these KQs, right? I was part of a series of um, summits that were held nationally for the field of infant and early childhood mental health several years ago. And we all developed some naughty questions and I thought I'd use that term, so I love it. A naughty question is kind of thorny, right? So my first naughty question for you is, what transformational experiences are needed and are foundational for staff at all levels and in all disciplines to form their capacities for empathy and care. And in a sense, that question is, how do we in professional development centers know that we are doing the right thing? Uh, by the way, what came to my mind, if you ever saw Blazing Saddles, the old movie, well, there's a preacher who preaches about are we doing the right thing. He says it in a more colorful way. But I do want to think about are we doing the right thing. The second naughty question is, and is it enough that we emphasize uh, the acquisition of knowledge and skills? I mean, is that all we should do? If, if they are, then how do we know we've done enough, that we've taught enough, and that you have enough skill? Um, and is that our only obligation as professional developers? The third naughty question is, and so when do we start this process? I mean, can someone who comes into our fold, uh, who appears to be lacking empathy and care, is it something we can cultivate in others? I mean, what are the ways we develop as individuals before we arrive at professional development centers? And how do we cultivate and develop those ways of learning? And when does it really start? That's a question I think I'm always, I think we're all fascinated by. Um, and fourthly, the fourth naughty question is, and how can we as humans use ourselves to help others? I had a great supervisor, and I'm gonna mention his name in a, in a moment, Dave Peters. I was honor my teachers. And he would say, in some sense, you have to be careful not to be helping yourself through your patient, right, or through your client. Uh, and so how do we know that we are helping the other instead of trying to heal and help ourselves? So Dave Peters had these great quotes. He would say, we need supervision to save our patients from ourselves. And I love that saying, although you may not like it because it suggests pathology, and yes, it's part of it, not only. 
were part of it. And so, but what kind of supervision? And that's where um, Deb mentioned our initiative is really about reflective work, to focus on our experiences, our thoughts, our feelings that are directly connected to the work. Reflective supervision is not psychotherapy. It doesn't mean you are required to talk about your personal material, but it is based on the idea that you feel trusting and opening, open in a relationship where you feel safe and calm and supported. And it serves, I think, as a scaffold right, to really acquire knowledge. I love this saying, Dave Peters would give us a bunch of these great sayings, right? When you over-identify with your patient, there are two patients and no doctor. I used to love this. <laughs> right, he would say to us, you know, did you ever have a, a client or a family you fall in love with? You just really think about them right, when you go home. They certainly, it's wonderful, but there's a barrier concern, right? There's a concern about over-identifying. I use this with parenting. Deb and I were talking about our own parenting of adult kids now. And I used to say, you know, if you over-identify with your child, there are two children and no parent. So sometimes we have to really have the ability to separate, right? Um, so, a fish discovers he's in water. I used to love this saying, right? And I made this, by the way, I'm so proud of making this graphic. <laughs> <clears throat> uh, I have no CGI skills at all, but I made this. And the, you've heard this notion, right? A fish doesn't know it's in water, right? We don't know our own experience often because it's what we see from the inside. And I love, in some sense, that at some point in our work, we say to ourselves, oh crap, that's what I'm thinking. It's different than what other people are thinking. So this is what the fish discovers he's in water says, where the heck am I? How did I get here? And I want you to think about that. So I'm gonna show you a very difficult to watch clip of a therapist, a mother, and a baby. This is a dear, my dear friend of mine, dear one of my teachers, Michael Trout. Some of you may know of the name Selma Freiberg. Uh, Selma Freiberg was a key figure in our field, the key figure in many ways, besides a long tradition of others. Michael Trout was one of her students, and Michael Trout was one of my teachers back in the 80s, and Michael and I have done work together since then. Um, he said to me, Professor Freiberg opened her eyes and we couldn't close them again. <clears throat> and I think the field of infant and early childhood mental health does that for us. But this is a case of a, a, a child named Bonnie and her mother. And <clears throat> I'm going to show you this clip. Admittedly, it's a very difficult clip to watch. But I want to explain why I'm showing it to you. All right, so I'll first just let it happen. <laughs> Returning to the family we met at the beginning of this unit, we can now review this central philosophy of assessment and practice attending to alternate methods by which families speak. Certainly it is unsettling to observe such chaos, such dyssynchronous interactions, such physical smothering and physical attacks. Make it stay. But we are forced to ask ourselves many questions. Why would a mother who has stated her extreme fear of losing her child go to such lengths on film to display the problems? How may we understand mothers clutching at and over controlling of her child? Does our interpretation of mother's behavior change when we learn that she experienced the death of a newborn several years ago and the loss of her only two other children during her pregnancy for this child? At this point in the assessment, mother has not yet found the words to tell us of these losses, but are there other ways that she draws our attention to the issue? But I'm going to give you something else. What about her recounting while giving the history of this child's developmental milestones that she once looked out the window when this child was eight months of age and saw her walking down the road? In actual fact, this child did not walk until she was about 28 months of age.
What about mother's extreme difficulty tolerating a few moments of separation requested by the examiner, made more acute when the child turns to the examiner and quietens, whereupon mother removes her shoes, the means by which we all walk. In a simpler assessment, we might assume merely that mother removes her daughter's shoes to prevent her from kicking. But this child has been kicking for most of the first hour of this assessment. Why does mother take action at just the moment her child seems to be turning away? Kid, this is enough. Is mother speaking to us in code about the losses of her other children when she stops at another point in this assessment? while looking with her child at a storybook about animals and tells her daughter about a kitty they used to have. Mother then cries as she recalls the death of that kitty, adding, that's the way it goes, honey. Indeed, that is the way it has gone for this mother. See what happens? You've, you've seen this behavior before, I'm sure. Yes, certain. I have. What seems to help, Mrs. Ryan? Uh, nothing except an undone, that's all I know. Does it usually uh, seem to calm it down after a while? She gets over it. She's going through a ball head streak right now. And uh, she does this occasionally. Must be pretty hard for you to. Oh, see yeah, but you. when you love them, they, you put up a front line. You know? So. If, uh, if we had time, right, uh, it would be almost a, a, a requirement uh, to, to unpack this with you a little bit, to talk with you about what it got stirred up in you, um, how, how it felt to watch this, this uh, moment in, in a mother and, and child relationship. And I bet you this is an unusually gifted audience. I really believe that. But I bet you that if we were to show this to many people and we took a poll and said, how many of you have empathy for this baby? How many people would raise their hands? I think lots. But if I were to say, how many of you have empathy for this mother? That might be a harder question, right? And yet, what does the clinician say? It must be pretty hard for you. That certainly wasn't on my mind when I first saw that, right? Um, and I said, wow. I want to be formed like he is. It must be pretty hard for you. What happened in his formation, this clinician's formation, that would lead a helper to ask that question in that moment? What allowed the helper to have empathy for a parent who in the moment was hurting her child? Right? How is it that the helper attended not to his own sense of shock or horror, but to have empathy for a parent in pain. That's what I want to figure out. And that's what I believe I'm trying to get to when I speak about what we need in formation. What do we need to grow? And so I'm reminded that many times in our society, we tend to think of enumerating and measurement as what we do to everybody. You know, I'm an early childhood um, person and I chaired a statewide committee in early childhood education uh, for the school boards association of my state and I remembered at the time this was in the late 80s reading a wonderful article that had the following quote <clears throat> and I wish I could remember the person who said it it wasn't me though and the quote was you don't fatten the calf by weighing it all the time right measurement right so we look at things and so I love this quote and you've heard it I'm sure I'm not even sure if Yates said this, by the way. I've, I've subsequently found out it could be someone else who said this. But education is not the filling of a pail, but the lighting of a fire. And so, in some sense, the question we have in early infant and early childhood centers of formation, how do we light the fire? What are the ways of knowing and learning in you and us that we must cultivate? is emphasizing, again, the question, the acquisition of skill, uh, knowledge and skill enough. And again, what are the educational and experiential encounters? And I want you to think about that. 
What experiences you, must you have in order for you to develop the kind of empathy and understanding and compassion and in the moment that presence, especially when a parent is not doing such a great job, right? So the experiential factors, the transformational experiences that really are foundational. So the curiosity over the years, these are all the terms we've used for what we do, professional education, professional development, skill building, I'm sure you've heard that, training. Uh, I did a training in South Dakota about 10 years ago, and a four-day training with my colleagues, and one of the uh, heads of the institute said, uh, Jerry, I feel like for four days you kind of sawed the top of my head off, took it out, and just poured all this stuff in. And it was a terrible metaphor, I know. But, um, uh, but, but the idea that, and I thought, well, I hope that's great, but is that all we're about? Is that all we are? And I hope not. I hope not, right? Um, again, we need to know techniques and strategies and all of that, but the word that I most began to feel captured this was formation. So what is student formation? It involves the development of the whole student such that education integrates their intellectual prowess, their life experiences, and their self-reflection to bring them to an understanding of how their whole self interacts with the material. And I think that's what formation is. It ultimately, it's an education that's focused on formation. When it's an education focused on formation, it helps us to encourage students to discover who they are called to be uh, and to have the foundational capacities necessary to live out that vision. So the Carnegie Foundation I mentioned had done a series of studies. They called it formation interestingly, and they looked at physicians and nurses and clergy and engineers and lawyers. And they said, interestingly, the most overlooked aspect of professional preparation for those uh, careers was the formation of a professional identity with a moral core of service and responsibility. So this change from a focus on educational inputs like a course on professional responsibility to a focus on clearly articulated learning outcomes related to each student's ethical development is really uh, what they wanted to see as a major paradigm shift. I'm going to embarrass her, I'm sure, but there's Amita here. All right, Amita, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. To, I'm, you didn't sneeze, uh, so I, I don't want to embarrass you. Amita is really driven in her career to help people think differently about, about infants and mothers and, and, and uh, birthing. Uh, I think this idea that she is trying to form professional identities early in a person's career, right? Many of us, I don't know about you, I'm a developmental psychologist, PhD in developmental psychology. I didn't learn about infancy when I was in graduate school. We didn't learn much about infants. We, I knew Mary Ainsworth's work, and that's about it, and John Bowlby. I think Amita's trying to form professional identity. I think it's really important for us to have a professional identity, to have undergraduate students say, I'm interested in infant mental health. I'm interested in babies. Not, not when we're 35 or 40, and that's not bad. I'm 70, so I'm, you know, I'm way past that. But I think it's important to form professional identity, and I think that's part of what I, I hope formation thinks about. So formation to me conveys the notion of a personal unfolding. You become who you are. It's part of your process. I'm going to talk about this later, but Heinz Kohut is a wonderful uh, psychoanalyst, and he's written uh, a lot about analysis. He has a book called How Does Analysis Cure? And he has this saying, and it's not quietly, quite said this way, but I think it really it means it. He said, um, if you are thinking about your theory when you are with your patient, you are not thinking about your patient. Right? And I love that idea because what I hope, you know, when I was a young clinician, and I still do this, and I'm not a young clinician anymore, I still say sometimes in the moment I'm with a family or a child, what does this mean? Uh, what am I supposed to do? You know? And sometimes I would even say, well, a, what does my theory tell me? But what I've learned with formation is if you can really have good folks in your life who help you and you cultivate that reflective development, there's a part of you that begins to behave in a way that integrates all the stuff you've learned. 
And it's not just your theory, it's you. It's part of your delivery, that's what formation is. So you, you get the idea, right? That in order for us to really be good at this stuff, we have to really be fairly healthy, you know, fairly well established. I had a good friend who would say, uh, psychotherapy is the art of lending yourself to someone else. And if you're not so healthy, you know, it, it's, and, and by the way, I, I'm a fan for neurosis. Believe me, I, 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 know, I, I know we are garden variety neurotics, we all are, but I think this idea of reflective self and really trying to understand yourself is really what it's about. So this personal unfolding, it reflects a way of becoming, of being, and as you'll hear me talk about, of being with, uh, and it implies this idea that you're integrating and balancing your knowledge and emotion and relationships. They're all intertwined. So it em emphasizes, however, this notion of formation, transactional and the experiential nature of development. We develop through relationships. If anything, we've learned from the neurosciences, we've known this in the psychology sciences, that it's not just training or transmission of knowledge or teaching skills. The learner must be actively engaged and it must create an intuitive sense of service, an intuitive sense of service. And so that's why these terms for me have really led to formation. So, there are three ways of developing I want to just touch on. This is certainly going to be a survey, not a de an in-depth study. The first one is called ways of knowing. And this represents probably the more traditional focus of, of training. So knowledge from theory and research and practice uh, must occur. You know, we're not just social visitors when you make a home visit. We're there for a thoughtful, principled visit. We have to have some knowledge. We offer something, right? But in and of itself, such knowledge to me is tantamount uh, to becoming a technician, right? We're not technicians, you know? And so a skill builder maybe is important, but it's not that enough. It's not enough. It's that we have to also be a promoter of human development um, as human engagement, connection, uh, really particularly with infants and young children is primarily affective and relational. Um, I'm a real fan of this term. My favorite word is wonder. And I use it in every way imaginable I can. I wonder what's going on. I wonder what you're feeling. I wonder what just happened. I wonder what's going on inside of me, you know. Uh, and Karl Popper is a philosopher of science who I adore. Um, and, and my chapter begins with this quote, what matters, and I want you to think about this because I love it, right? What matters is not methods or techniques, but a sensitivity to problems and a consuming passion for them, uh, or as, as the Greeks said, the gift of wonder. Do, we, do you all know people who don't have a PhD, who don't have any degrees, but who just spend time with people and you get, they get people? They, you, you feel healed by having them listen to you? I want to be one of those people. I would gladly give up my PhD uh, if I could be one of those people. At least that's who I think we are called to be. That's the service that we're called to be. So ways of knowing, I think, should adopt a posture of wondering. I don't know everything. I wonder what's going on. I wonder what's happening in the baby and the, and the older child and, and in the family worker, yourself, what's going on. Again, this suggests that the process of coming to know and understand must involve an awareness of the many forces that influence us and, uh, and, and the things that we need to, what we encounter and observe in families. So these forces are within the child in his or her life and within the worker. Yeah, what you'll discover, I think, is a lot of times we go and get educated about how we can best help to teach a child or help a child or deal with challenging behaviors. And there's not enough saying, and what about you? What about you? You know, I'm going to talk about preschool expulsion uh, a little bit in my instruction, in my uh, session, but I'll just mention this. There's some recent research by um, Chantel Meek and Walter Gilliam from Yale uh, that demonstrate that, in fact, teachers who are higher on depression have more preschool expulsion happening. That's not a child variable. That's a teacher variable, right? And so if we think the problem is how do we get these kids to behave, and we don't have to think about ourselves, we're sorely mistaken, right? We are sorely mistaken. We have to be that source, so formation is about that. Authentic knowledge comes from science and practice, but it's not adequate alone. 
So then we have to talk about another way of developing, ways of doing. Now, ways of doing is kind of similar um, to what you would imagine. I'm sure many of you are typically up here and, and I'm sitting in the audience. You do teaching, you do training. Everything I've ever done, someone comes up to me and says, ah, Jerry, that was really good, I appreciate it. Um, but what do I do? I have a kid who's biting, right? They want to know a technique. They want to know a strategy. I have a friend who says, well, tell them to go to page 64, line 7, technique C. And that's try that, right? It's not that formulaic, right? But we all, all professionals, always want to know what to do. And so I think, by the way, we have a reasonable expectation to provide techniques and strategies, right? It's not a one-size-fits-all. Because the truth is, you know, similar behaviors originate from varying reasons. Uh, I've done, I was a Head Start director uh, for three years in the 70s and 80s, and I've done a lot of work in Head Start as a, an infant and early childhood mental health consultant. And I would uh, work a lot in early Head Starts, and I would go to the center, and I would walk in, and this would happen often. The teacher would come up to me and say, boy, Jerry, do we have a kid for you? And I'm thinking, he's two. How do you get worse than that? I said, so I began to define my job as saving kids' reputations, to help them not have a bad reputation at the age of two, right? And so we need techniques, but we have to understand that the behavior that you see can originate from so many different places, and that's not a one-size-fits-all. So we have to support the development of skills uh, in observation, in assessment, in, in intervention skills, that's all part of it. But if these skills, by the way, are really good ones, but if they are delivered in a way that is insensitive to the individualized needs of a particular child or to the unique qualities of the helper, they're gonna fail, right? If you don't have that delivery, right? So ways of new, no, uh, doing is, is really uh, clear that even if you have the right words and the techniques but are delivered in a, a certain way, it's not going to be helpful, right? The negative response to the nonverbal context often outweighs the intent of the good stuff. So in formation, we think about knowing and doing, but it has to be done within the context of being with and relating. So the third way I want to touch on is ways of being with. To me, this is the area that we have to really focus much more on in professional development. So this domain addresses the capacity to form attuned, empathic, contingent, co-regulating, caring relationships with the infants and children and families to whom professionals provided service. This is the how you are, that's what Deb said um, from Jerry Paul, Dr. Jerry Paul, the late, recently late Dr. Jerry Paul who um, wrote this wonderful monograph with her colleague Maria St. John, how you are is as important as what you do. And this is the how you are. So services are always provided within the context of relationships, this relationship-based formulation. Whatever you do to help families, you're not giving them something that they take away. It's you. It's the way you are and what you are delivering. So skills and techniques are always delivered by people. So the reason why we have to think about ways of being with is because there's so much neuroscientific evidence that shows us that the infant and young child's brains are ordinarily processing experiences first at the lower levels of brain development, subcortical, above the top level of our brain, but also the right side of the brain, which is much more online for babies than the left side. And so the right side is more tuned to affect and gestures and pacing and movement. Uh, I would tell the story, I'm, I'm an Italian and my grandmother would hold me as a baby and so she would say in Italian, Giudo uh, I'm sorry folks in my session, I'm telling the same joke, right? But, I, uh, but she would say, oh Giudo you're so cute, I could eat you. And Gerarduch meant cute little Gerard, and that ship passed, right? But so uh, she would say, uh, she would say, "Oh, Gerarduch, you're so cute." And I would think, if I understood her words, I would think she's a cannibal, right? But what what I knew she was by her affect and gestures. So it's all of these things during the preverbal period, especially, uh, our, and throughout our lifetime, 
Uh, humans discern much more about the social meaning of an exchange um, through the nonverbal systems. And this inextricable connection between our emotion-based psychological and neurobiological systems is really part of what we have been learning from the neuroscience, and that this really has to be something we learn in formation. So one of the theories I mentioned to you is a theory um, called polyvagal theory, and it's uh, developed by a neuroscientist, Stephen Porges. We have 12 cranial nerve bundles, 12 nerves that emanate from our various parts of our brain. One of those, the vagus nerve, it turns out, seems to have in his judgment, in his theory, this role that it plays, that it actually has fibers and bundles that connect facial musculature and facial expressions to heart rate cardiac rhythms, the face-to-heart connection, he calls it. And so he talks about how the first thing that babies look for in life is safety, and that they learn that safety is through connectedness. So he talks about connectedness, relationships, as a, as a biological evolutionary imperative. And so he says co-regulation, helping babies calm, begins with the mother-infant relationship and extends throughout lifetime to other partners as well. And he talks about how from the transition, in the transition in evolution, from, um, uh, to, from reptiles to mammals, social behavior and connectedness emerged as the prepotent regulator of physiology. When we're excited, we look for people to help in my in my t uh, session, we talked about the jack-in-the-box, how a jack-in-the-box frightens a kid, but how does a kid learn that's not scary? Um, so I know you'll have to hear that some other time. So this is reflected in this beautiful drawing by Colwyn Trevorthen, a British infant mental health specialist. But the truth is it's not just between babies and mothers who are reading each other's signals and brain-to-brain -brain communication. This is happening all the time. It's true for us as adults as well when we connect with other adults. How many times have you had someone who's depressed or sad and talking with you and you can feel yourself feeling that sadness? Dan Siegel, this wonderful uh, neuropsychiatrist and author, talks about that as a resonance circuit. We are like tuning forks, he says. When someone's brain is feeling something, we feel it with them, right? And so that's part of our human physiology. So polyvagal theory maintains our nervous system needs to feel safe. Our nervous system expects features of safety to be present, such as caring face-to-face -face interactions and warmly modulated voices. And I, I want to think about that voice thing. And when we don't get those features of safety, our safety brain needs to feel safe, that gets activated. And if we don't feel safe, we have the fight or flight or freeze response. And that deactivates our thinking brain. And then we have a hard time repairing and restoring. And so connectedness is what helps us uh, to feel safe, but it has to be in a certain way. And this quote from the article that I've, I've put in the portal, humans are on a quest to calm neural defense systems by detecting features of safety. This quest is initiated at birth when an infant's need to be soothed is dependent on the caregiver. And so as I said to you, in mammals, this vagal pathway originates in a part of the brainstem that regulates the heart, but also is connected to the striated muscles of the face so that there's this face to uh, head, face to heart connection, I'm sorry, that forms this integrated social engagement system. Now, why am I telling you all this about your work, right? Your families need to feel safe from you. You need to convey a sense that they are safe in being with you. Every single one of us, when we meet someone for the first time or in a new situation, you may not know this, the first thing we do is look for features of safety. We look for people's, we, look, we detect people's voices and look at their facial expressions. I, I joke that when I was a young kid, eight years old in church and I messed up, I could tell that one muscle in my mother's face that meant I was in trouble, <laughs> right? Because we all study, babies study faces. All of us under stress, by the way, study faces. When we are under stress, we are looking for safe faces. So who you are, how you are, is just part of how families experience you. And if you know a lot and you know techniques, but haven't thought about the other stuff, 
we may be missing an important part of your formation and our effectiveness. So again, this allows us to convey and to help others feel safer through facial expression and voice. And so the way he says this in the, in the article is the neuroception, neuroception means the automatic reception, the automatic understanding of familiar individuals who have the appropriately prosodic voices and warm expressive faces, who have the right kind of tone of voice and facial expressions, really helps downregulate us and helps us feel safe. And by the way, this is true in all cultures, right? So in all cultures, it's not just voice, although it's often voice. It could be rhythm, drumming, movement, pacing. These are all the ways we are learning um, that we can, we can um, help calm things. And by the way, I mentioned think of shark music because that's just the opposite. If you remember the shark music, dun dun, the from Jaws, dun dun, dun dun. Uh, many researchers use that, by the way. Any of you familiar with Circle of Security? Uh, parenting, right? so they, they use shark music as well. And this is, I love this cartoon because it really says what my, my culture is. Half of my problems are because of the tone of my voice. Everyone thinks I'm arguing while I'm actually just talking. That's like could be an Italian. And, and I think sometimes we really have to think about how we're coming across. So what are the experiences you need, we need, in order for us to be focused on formation? I think we need a holding environment. I think we all need someone around us who can be attuned with us, co-regulating with us, containing us. I think we need a feeling um, with others. We need the ability to feel with others. I talked right left here. This is where you need to feel the right hemisphere before you work to the left hemisphere. You need to feel a child's feelings before you talk to them about it. This is true for a family. Before you guide them and offer them support and ideas, um, we have to sit at the feet of families and wonder what it's like for them. Right? Uh, Michael Trout and Gil Foley, a dear buddy of mine, wrote this wonderful article, and that, that quote I just gave came from them. And they offer you another meta metaphor, which I think fits in. We have to be students of families before we become their teachers. Right? How do we become students? Listen, feel with, wonder. So these are part of it. I also think we have to have a shared sense of wonderment with another. Like, wow, you know, I, I don't know if I know what this is, but I want to kind of sit here with you and figure this out. We have to certainly have knowledge about human development and interpersonal processes. You know, you're, you're not casually visiting. You're an expert. You have knowledge. You have to know that. But you have to have self-awareness and the ability to be reflective. And again, I think you have to have a deep sense of modesty and connectedness to human frailty. Um, just, and by the way, uh, Michael Trout, who was the person in that video, I continue to marvel at the stuff I've seen with Michael because, again, I thought there was a real sense of modesty, a real sense of wondering that he had with the mother, and the capacity to suspend judgment, and finally, a deep sense of caring. So these are the things I think we need. So formation in the helping professions is a brain and a mind thing. It's both. It refers to the unfolding of a person. It integrates, I hope, your knowledge and experience that becomes expressed in ways of being with and in ways of doing with others. Right? And is not taught, I think, as much as caught uh, and experienced and felt, but certainly talking about it, conceptualizing it really can help. So it integrates emotion and your intellect. It involves authentic action. I think the hardest part of our work is in the moment. You know, there's nobody, I mean, in some therapeutic programs like PCIT and others, they have a bug in the year, right? Most of the times you're in the room by yourself, you're visiting the family by yourself. And, so in the moment, you sort of have to try to figure out how can I best be helpful and do what's best, and of course, you bring it back to supervision. It involves, this is what I said, it involves thinking of the patient, not your theory. This is Heinz Kohut, right? Not thinking about your theory. Think of the person in front of you. It requires that you become aware of your own inner life. My favorite supervisor in life, Taya Bree, would say you have to get in cahoots with yourself all the time, and I always like that. Uh, oh, there you are, Taya Bree. Uh, I knew she was there. Uh, Taya's always with me. Uh, and be sure that someone has your back. Always someone has to have your back. So this is the overall model I'm proposing, right? That formation involves ways of knowing, that's head, ways of doing, that's your hands, but ways of being with, that's the heart and spirit. And I suggest that the ways of being with are really the least addressed adequately in our work, and we have to make it uh, front and center.
So um, in the Carnegie Foundation, Foundation reports, I, I thought this was a great quote. Uh, and this, the red uh, highlighting is my words, but the rest is the quote. The, Holler, the Halloran Center studies show that preparing for a successful legal career requires both a high level of knowledge and skill in legal analysis and the ability to sustain relationships being with colleagues and especially with clients. Now, if this is good for lawyers, uh, it has to be good for us too, right? <laughs> so, so uh, you know, I, I thought it was a great thing. So I'm gonna try to wrap this up by, by sharing a, a couple of ideas. So I think one way to think about ourselves, and you've heard about this, I'm sure, is this notion of, of the public self, the private self, and the secret self. The public self is the part of you everyone meets and sees when you first meet them kind of casually. Then there's the private self, and that private self is a self that maybe those who are closer to you really get to know, and, and that includes family and members and those you work closely with. But then there's the secret self, and the secret self not even you know all the time, right? And so I think in formation, we have to engage all three selves. We must engage the public self, the private self, and the secret self. And again, I am not saying you have to disclose your secret self. That's psychotherapy. But you have to be aware you have a secret self. You have to ask your questions, where did that come from? Why am I feeling this irritation? Why am I feeling this anger? Why am I feeling such pain that I want to take this child home with me? What's going on? Where is that coming from? And those are thoughtful, genuine feelings, right? So in the article, I mentioned the following. Professional development is inseparable from personal development. Formation requires that professional growth involve the development of the whole person, such that education integrates your intellectual prowess, I said this earlier, life experiences, and these many layers of self that humans are. Self-reflection is part of the process which brings the professional to an understanding of how his or her whole self intersects with the learned materials and her work with infants, uh, children, and families. So I want to show you this quick grid, and you'll look at it um, on your own. You have a copy of this. But I think if you think about this, the self you know uh, and the self you don't know, right? And the self others know and the self others don't know, right? And if you look at each quadrant, I can give you examples of this. I'll tell you quickly. There's a self that I didn't know but others do know, uh, the knowable self. I was eating with one of my colleagues about six years ago for a training we did, and we went to lunch, and I had a standard meal, like a meat, a potato, and a vegetable. And as I'm eating, uh, about 20 minutes into the meal, we're talking, and he goes, Jerry, do you know that you eat one food group at a time? <laughs> I never realized I did that. All my life, I always eat the vegetables first because I want to get them out of the way. I then, <laughs> I then go for the potatoes because I like them, but then the meat's the last. It's my prize. But, but I swear to God, I never, ever since then, now I told my wife and kids, they see it now. They notice it. Sometimes people outside of you can see things about you that you just don't know, and you've got to feel safe enough to be able to talk about it. Now, talking about food was a pretty benign topic, but I'm just saying it was nice. So, but this idea just gives you uh, some, strain, some, some ideas, right? Uh, and so the self that you know and others know, that's the public self. That's you can talk about, acknowledge it, adapt. That's just the way I am, that stuff. Others don't know a self, but you know it. That's your private self. So having a good observing ego, making disclosures and trying to change, and sometimes just acceptance of who you are. This is just who you are. Then I told you a bit about the, no, the others know, but you don't know, and that could be through supervision, through wondering, through inquiry and discourse and adaptation and so on. And then the secret self, right, that others don't know, and sometimes you don't even know. And that involves reflective practices, psychotherapy, mindfulness, mindsight, a term uh, coined by Dan Siegel. So I'm going to try to end with this quickly because I only think I have a couple of minutes. I started a little late, so if I can just squeeze a couple of minutes. right? So I developed this little framework called AHA and Agile, which is kind of when we encounter folks, right? Um, try to pay attention to our own demeanor, our way of being with our nonverbals and preverbals. So um, first I think we try to 
understand what might be going on in the child or the family. So assess, look at the biopsychosocial framework if you remember that, right? And then develop some ideas or hypotheses about, you think, ways that might help. This might be what you say and what you do, but when you do say and do, when you act, act uh, always following, following uh, what's called the Agile guidelines. Pay attention to your affect, right? Your movement. Pay attention to your gestures, your movement, pacing. The intonation. Intonation is a remarkable way of, of expressing yourself, and sometimes it's the thing that really tells the truth, right? So if you're asking a person a question and they give you the answer you want, but they give it to you with a tone of voice that really undoes it, guess which one wins out? The nonverbal will always win. By the way, this is also a good uh, marital therapy uh, aid, right? <laughs> right? So, so think about all relationships, right? Um, latency, this is the one thing I wish I could have learned when I was younger. Slow down, wait, let someone take you in, let someone experience what they're experiencing, and then engage uh, people. And so I actually developed a little card. I, I don't think I have it in my pocket. I actually have a little laminated card that I give away. Uh, we should have raffled some. I have three of them here. I can raffle three of them. So we, I have three of them. You can raffle them. All right. So, <laughs> so, but this is a reminder for us, you know. And by the way, just as an example, I do a lot of work in, I used to do a lot of work in early childhood centers. I would walk into a center and I would look at how are the adults talking to each other? How are the adults talking with the kids? How are the kids talking with each other? You know, is there talking at all, right? But I would look at the affect, the gestures, the pacing, the movement. It was just remarkable. It's a, it's a nice benchmark. So what do we need? Uh, I think we need to reconceptualize how we prepare ourselves in the workforce. I think we have to focus more on the ways of being with. I think it's a commitment that we make as a field to the full range of human experiences, not just the data that someone identifies or what they think is the really real or the only evidence that exists, because there's more. It's a commitment to understanding how we come to know what we know, and that's why I talked about uh, pedagogy and epistemology. And it's a promise to help us all become fully human. And what's interesting is in the Carnegie Foundation, I love this quote, they said, identity formation trumps information transmission. And I love that idea. So I'm gonna show you a little clip I showed to my group yesterday uh, to show you how young in our lives we rely on affect and gestures and voice and, and those prosodic ways of feeling safe. Yo, comedian Michael Jr. here. As you know, I just flat out enjoy doing comedy. But one of the things I love way more than that is being a dad. Not too long ago, I'm going through some video footage, and I run into this video of my youngest daughter being born. Now, of course, I was there. I actually took the video, but I had never really experienced it from this perspective before. Now, look, we're in the hospital room. She's uh, sticky and she's baby and all that stuff. And she's in the middle of crying. And then I speak up. I start talking to her and watch how she responds when she hears my voice. It's okay, for her. look, I'm right here. It's okay, it's okay. I'm right here, I'm right here. We're doing just fine. It's okay. It's okay. I'm right here. Right here. Yeah. It's okay. It's okay, baby. It's okay. That was pretty awesome. <laughs> so check it. A few minutes later, uh, the nurse starts working on her, puts her pamper on her, and uh, I'm not saying anything, and she actually starts to cry again. Then I speak up. She hears my voice and stops crying like again but i want you to notice what else happens after i tell her that i love her portland it's okay it's okay it's good it's good it's good i'm right here i'm right here i am right here i love you i love you i love you yeah i'm right here i'm right here it's okay it's okay that's just phenomenal. 
<laughs> like, whoa. Here's the thing. We'll always have times where we're not as comfortable, probably even to the point of tears, where life is just heavy. The key thing to do in those moments is to be still and listen for the Father's voice because he is trying to talk to you. And I can tell you what he wants you to know is that he loves you. All you got to do is open your eyes. Happy Father's Day. Now, I, I want to tell you, Michael Jr. is a Canadian comedian, and he does have uh, this, which I didn't know at the time, this ministry where he does stuff. So he did bring, of course, a Father's Day greeting and also a more religious theme. And I, if, if, that, if that is good for you, I, I hope that is. But if that's not the message that I wanted you to use in seeing this or see or get the message was, how remarkable early in life babies are being wired to really respond to our voices and our relationships. So, um, so you heard my message, right? I mean, I'm, I'm, I love being 70 because I can say what I want to say, you know? And, and so what I want to say is I really think that we have to do this. But for those people who don't acknowledge, who refuse to acknowledge the need for us to shift to greater understanding about professional formation, my little cousin Madeline has a mes message for you, and I want to have Madison tell, Mar Madeline tell you. All right. Th thank you, Madeline. <laughs> All right. That's it. Thanks, folks. I know we're running a little behind, but that's fine. Um, we just won't worry about it. We have three of these Agile um, cards, so I'm going to raffle those off real quickly. And then we have books and real theater tickets. Um, OK. So for the first Agile card, Noelle Marsh, are you here? Yay. The Agile. The Agile. Um, let's see. Thank you so much, Jerry. Katie Palacio. All right, Katie. Sure. And then our last card. Okay, this person really got us a little one. Nicole Swenson. Are you here? All right, Nicole. Cool. 